I've talked about this before, but games reviewers can be subject to a kind of fatigue when a game which could otherwise be good or even great isn't much different from everything else you've been playing. It's harder to find new words to describe it and you start worrying that said fatigue is going to make you represent the game in a poorer light than you otherwise would have done. Mage's Initiation Reign of the Elements gave me the absolute opposite problem because the awkward title is but one of many, many things to talk about here. Compounding this, not only have I chosen to review mainly one particular genre, making that fatigue set in even faster, but I've also chosen to limit myself to 10 minutes based on a punny series title. I am an idiot. Anyway, it's available for Windows, Mac OS, Steam OS and Linux and here's the story. A 16 year old trainee mage named Dark is about to undergo his initiation to become a not trainee mage. Ten long years have passed since he was taken from his family to the mage's tower he now calls home. All that study and practice leading to this climactic moment when he will finally be worthy of those fancy robes and be free to make his mark on the world as he was born to do. Right after he steals some hair from a banished priestess, nicks an egg from some bird people and hunts down whatever the hell a trinicorn is. Also it might be in the future, it's vague. At least that's what I had to do. Strange unique thing number one is the fact that you need to choose a magic element, water, air, earth or fire, and each gives you a different magic to use. Which one you'll get comes down to either taking an Elder Scrolls style personality quiz or taking an Elder Scrolls style personality quiz and discarding the result. I'm glad you get the option to straight up choose, but I ended up going with what the quiz told me, which was water, mainly because I didn't get the slightest hint of what the elements embodied beforehand. I don't think it's unreasonable for Dark to get a rough idea about each element in his 10 years of studying magic, if not finding out the spells you'd be able to get. Some explanatory text popping up with a rough descriptor would have been nice, is what I'm saying. If the game sent me in blind on purpose, I didn't see the reason behind it. So once you're initiated, you'll get your very first spells, after solving a puzzle to find the damn room of course, as well as the chance to try the spells out. In combat. Yep, it's one of those RPG point click hybrids. Indeed, the game's Kickstarter cited Quest for Glory as an influence. Funny how many of these games turn out to be Quest for Glory but with only one class. Except Heroine's Quest for some reason, and that one's free. Not to mention very good, I've been told. I'm not going to comment much more on the near obligatory Quest for Glory comparison, since even though that's what it obviously reminded me of, I'm not familiar enough with the series to make a solid judgement. But there is a free demo available on the Kickstarter page if you need a rough indication of how the game plays. Bear in mind it's in a rougher state than the final game. Anyway, if nothing else, the combat differentiates itself from its influence by allowing you to move around the screen, usually for keeping out of enemies' range, not so useful when they've stun locked you, but that's what defensive spells are for. You can do everything with the mouse, moving, casting, drinking potions, the lot. But there's another control method available. It takes a little getting used to, you move with the WASDA or arrow keys, select a spell with the number keys, and fire them off with the spacebar. Once you're used to it, it's okay. Mercifully, the combat pauses when you move your mouse up to the spell bar at the top, so remember that if you haven't been in a fight for a while and you find yourself getting a bit flustered. Because the game doesn't usually autosave for you before a fight starts. If you go down in combat, you'd better hope you've got a recent save to restore. Although if all that becomes a bit much, the developer is working on a no combat patch. It's in beta on Windows only at the time of writing. You can also use the keyboard controls to move around outside of combat. Which I don't recommend for two reasons. One, any dialogue which triggers from entering a screen will get skipped if you have a button held down. And two, you'll constantly be getting caught on scenery in places you really wouldn't expect. I even got myself stuck by entering a new screen that way. Lucky for me, a save and restore fixed it. There's actually another similar bug near the end which disabled my keyboard controls. Again, save and restore bailed me out, but if you're going to do that, remember to use the new save slot. Or just click on all your destinations and rely on the pathfinding to get you there. Dark might seem a bit slow at first, but double clicking will have him break into a run, which shift will also do if you're using the keyboard. Unless you go to use something, in which case you'll always do the slow, boring walk over to the object. Doubly weird is the fact that if you do the same thing with the talk verb, you can then click once more to skip to the destination. Easier to double click the floor next to the object, wait for Dark to get there, then use the hotspot. A little awkward, but I prefer it to not having fast movement at all. Speaking of options, you get to decide which clicky interface you want to use. There's free to choose from, a verb coin interface, a Sierra style interface with drop down bar and cycling through the verb list, and this one I don't really have a name for. Greg. His name is Greg. No matter which one you choose, you'll notice at the top of the screen names whatever you're hovering over, or bottom of the screen if you pick that option, but shows your current location if the cursor isn't on anything. 
Just bear that in mind if you're hunting through the pixels for a hotspot and this one weird object keeps coming back. I ended up sticking with the Vercoin interface because I didn't like the look of Greg and I've never clicked with the Sierra interface. The fact that you either need to open the bar or cycle through all the verbs to get the one you want is a little too much work for me. Perfectly fine to see them as options though. I'm not necessarily in love with the verb coin either. Considering the size of the thing, its buttons are also on the small side, and if you want to use a spell or item other than the one selected, since you can only ever have one of each ready at a time, you need to dive into another screen to get it. It's within these screens that you'll also find your character info, health, mana, stats, equipment, all that RPG business. Performing certain actions in the game will give you XP, which go towards levels, which go towards building up your stats. I believe these only apply to combat, I haven't seen them used anywhere else, so that's another step away from Quest for Glory that this game takes. Something a bit closer to RPG territory would be the side quests you can do, or errands as the game calls them. They usually boil down to going someplace, killing some critters, poking their corpses and returning for money. A bit like when you're asked to collect 10 bear arses in an MMO. Thankfully you're paid per item here rather than having to hit a quota. In fact, these errands feel a little bit like daily quests. And the MMO comparisons kind of tie into the combat controls now I think about it. Anyway, the errands will get you money for buying items, either for puzzle purposes or for not dying to a goblin purposes. And if you're heading into these areas anyway, Anyway, it gives you a little something back for the effort. If that's not to your fancy, there's always a gambling mini game for those who want less effort and more risk. Point is, there's always a way to make money, you won't get stuck. The main quest and the puzzles therein on the other hand are much closer to traditional adventure game territory with the odd boss battle or a bit of back and forth thrown in. Certain situations might compel you to return to the mage's tower and read up on a situation for example. Others might require you to use magic, with the particular spells and situations varying based on your chosen flavour of magic. New spells are given out after completing one of your tasks, so barring a major screw up in the dev process, you'll not be without the tools you need. Before we jump away from the RPG talk, you also get to make some key plot decisions, more so than your favourite colour of robes. Whilst these do have some impact in the game, the dev already has some sequels planned and your decisions will apparently affect those games if you import your save file. We might be talking about deciding another character's fate, might be as simple as keeping a promise. I like this. Following the script to find out what happens is fine, it's worked for many years, but having you make choices and showing that they have some kind of impact, that's pretty neat. I'll soften the jump off the RPG talk train with a bit of a segue. RPGs can be quite a talky genre in the same way that pointy clicks are, so it's unsurprising that this game has a fairly large amount of dialogue. Just about everything you could want to know about land and lore can be told to you in many fine locations. The TARDIS like Mage's Tower, the local town square, this guy's room that has a sundial indoors for some reason. On top of that, the game features lip syncing to go with its fully voiced dialogue. Which is fine if it means people other than the protagonist are talking because once again I'm questioning the voice direction of a game. The main character was given a good voice, nothing wrong with the actual sound of it, but it has this slow, almost patronising quality to it. A well-worn play rope hangs from the upper branch of the tree. As if I'm listening to a nursery school teacher's or reading a particularly sarcastic explain it like I'm five post. And if there's one character you don't want to have bad voice direction, it's the one you spend the whole game with. The rest of the cast are something of a mixed bag, but they don't ever go below average, I think. In any case, it might not even annoy you as much as it did me, and I certainly didn't find it to be a deal breaker myself. Because after nine or so hours, I've realised this game has a lot to offer. A lengthy title, but one with substance behind it. There's a strong set of trials to go through and a big pile of world building if you want it. The only criticisms I have are that it's a little more linear than I'd expect a Quest for Glory inspired title to be. That and the protagonist's voice direction. It's locked tight. I can't open it. If any of that is your bag, and bearing in mind it runs on all the platforms that Steam supports, then £12 doesn't sound like a bad price to me, were it not for those glitches I mentioned. Now, I got past them with a save and restore, but I can't guarantee that'll work for you or presume that you'll have the patience to persevere. We're still talking about potentially game-breaking bugs here. The dev is still patching the game though, there's a chance this'll all get ironed out. So if Mage's initiation does pique your interest, you've got two choices. Buy the game, save constantly and hope, or keep an eye on the update news. Here's hoping those promised patches do the trick, because whilst I think the game is worth getting, I really wish I could recommend it without those caveats. Hello, thanks for watching to the end. If you're so inclined to leave a comment, a like, a dislike, whatever you fancy, please do. Or if you really like what I'm doing here, I do have a Patreon if you want to contribute money. Links in the description. Thanks again and cheerio!